Here's a guy who thinks he has a way to do two contradictory things, both of which are prescribed by the Bible. Should we answer the fool according to his folly or not? Well, today's question centers around Proverbs 26, 4 and 5, which says, four says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. But then of course, uh, it, it says in 5, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, we're going to note that the apparent contradiction between these verses will vanish uh, in their application as we'll show. But anyway, let's break this down. Isn't it counterintuitive that the purportedly perfect, infallible Word of God would have even apparent contradictions, let alone actual ones? Why would a perfect author write a book that has passages that bear even the remotest resemblance to a contradiction? I guess we are to believe that the perfect, inerrant word of an infallible author was written with the communication skills of a yodeler sculpted out of coleslaw. The first thing we need to figure out is who we're talking about here. And the proverb says it's the fool. So who is that? Well, the Bible says, the fool says in their heart, there is no God. That's Psalm uh, 14, 1. So the Bible clearly identifies atheists as fools. I mean, why? There's obviously atheists that have high IQ. I used to call myself one, and there's people way smarter than me that say they don't believe in God. So this foolishness that the psalmist mentions is obviously not pure cognitive ability. It's a mindset or a worldview that omits the idea of God, which can't lead to wise, wise conclusions. It's not just my worldview that omits the idea of God. It's my ability to comprehend concepts, which is simply unable to digest the concept of God, at least with respect to the God articulated by theologians who say that God is a timeless, spaceless, disembodied mind. To say that such a thing exists contradicts my understanding of the concept of existence. I don't understand what it means to say that something exists if it doesn't have a location in space-time. Okay, so what's the fool's folly? Well, although this verse may be speaking about a variety of people being foolish, we know that atheists are definitely counted among them, so, so let's identify what the fool's folly is for atheists. Classical atheists declare there is no God. So do you intend to rebut atheists generally, or do you only intend to rebut what you refer to as classical atheists? Looks like you're narrowing the goalposts here. So they have to have a way of explaining their existence without a supernatural creator. Why? How does that follow? If someone doesn't have an alternative explanation for why they exist, why does that obligate them to adopt theism? I don't understand why the fact that a person may be unconvinced of a particular explanation for a particular phenomenon obligates them to propose an alternate explanation for that phenomenon. And the only option for them then is some form of evolution. No matter what you call it, Darwinian evolution, neo-Darwinian evolution, chaos theory, punctuated equilibrium, etc. It's the constant that everything came about through naturalistic processes. Until he said about, I didn't notice that this video was from Answers in Genesis Canada. And that is the foolishness the psalmist speaks about. A theos, no God. The fool says in their heart, there is no God. So atheists, many claiming that they're open-minded, rational, and logical, live inside of a mental paradigm called naturalism, and they don't think outside that box. It's not merely the case that I don't think outside the box in the sense that I simply neglect to think outside of it or refuse to think outside of it. The reason I don't think outside of it is because I don't know how to think outside of it. I don't know how to conceive of something as existing without it occupying space-time. I don't understand what it means for anything supernatural to exist. When when folks like this talk about atheists, they do so as though they think they are either neglecting or are outright refusing to consider their positions. They don't seem to accept that many of us repeatedly make good faith efforts to try and nonetheless consistently fail to understand what they are even trying to tell us when they talk about the supernatural. They often consider their failure to get through to us as merely due to our desire to sin or rebel or some such thing. They are not open to the possibility that what they are trying to tell us just doesn't make any sense, so to speak. So all thinking atheists must believe in evolution. Believing in evolution is something that will be common among all thinking and informed people, regardless of whether they are atheists. Also, there were thinking atheists before the idea of evolution was ever invented. 
That's their main folly. If God created a world in which making the simplest inference from the overwhelming preponderance of evidence is folly, then God made a universe that is fundamentally deceptive. So here's what not to do. Verse 4 says not to answer a fool according to his folly or you will be like him. That means Christians shouldn't answer atheists by buying into their way of thinking or else they will appear foolish themselves. If a Christian at least acknowledges that evolution is the most probable explanation for the biological evidence we see, then they won't appear foolish foolish to us in that regard. Old Earth creationists seem at least somewhat less foolish to me than young Earth creationists. I mean, the last thing an atheist ne needs to hear from a Christian is they affirm their foundational doctrine, evolution, is true. Where did you get the idea that evolution is a foundational doctrine of atheism? Atheists existed long before the idea of evolution was ever conceived. So, declaring one to, uh, Genesis 1-11 to is uh, compatible with evolution, it's practically indefensible against an informed opponent because uh, of the effects that this would have on the entire biblical narrative. By affirming evolution in long ages before humans appeared, Christians can't even explain the gospel rationally. What does the gospel have to do with evolution? Or, or give a ready answer to the number one philosophical question skeptics ask about Christianity, which is, if, if, if there's such a loving God, why is there so much death and suffering? I don't know what that has to do with the truth or falsehood of evolution either, but the main question with respect to suffering is not why a loving God allows it, but more specifically, why a loving and all-powerful God allows it. Uh, your God used billions of years of death and suffering to create and called it very good? Nice God you got there, buddy. Even if you believe that the world is only five or six thousand years old, there have been at least that many years of death and suffering that is hard to reconcile with the idea of a God which is both loving and all-powerful, so I don't see why the time span matters. I mean, so what should we do? Well, Proverbs 26, 5, it says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will appear wise in his own eyes. In this case, it's the second half of the verse that provides the context as to how to answer. I can remember that as an atheist, when I met Christians who could not answer my questions or seemed to try to avoid certain topics and reroute the conversation towards something more comfortable, I often felt that they were simply mentally inferior and illogical because they wouldn't engage my concerns intellectually. I don't assume that they are intellectually inferior. I simply infer that they are not really interested in engaging my concerns intellectually. I don't think that they really have intellectual concerns of their own, at least not the same concerns that I have. I doubt that intellectual concerns are the reasons why they are religious in the first place. They seem mostly to appeal to emotional arguments from morality, and I became wise in my own eyes because I felt that the Christian faith was for, for simpletons that just you know couldn't deal with science and evolution. My inference is not that they can't deal with those things. My inference is that, at the end of the day, they don't really care about those things. My suspicion is that they just get a sense of satisfaction from the idea that they have fulfilled some variety of prescribed duty, with no regard to whether that duty makes any sense. At least, I infer that this is true of at least some religious apologists. I'm sure that motivations vary from apologist to apologist. It wasn't until I met a Christian that answered me according to my folly, i.e. understood what evolutionists taught and believed and then pointed out the numerous obvious challenges to it, making me step back and defend it intellectually, that I no longer felt so wise. I now had to put on my thinking cap and try to rally a defense around this whole evolutionary concept instead of just regurgitating evolutionary talking points that I'd been taught that I assumed were, you know, um, well, I assumed them rather than robustly critiqued and arrived at logically, so. It's fascinating that this guy seems to think that folks who believe in evolution just haven't considered creationists' arguments in good faith. They seem incapable of accepting the notion that many of us have considered creationist rebuttals and simply can't make any sense of them, let alone find ourselves capable of finding them more convincing than the Darwinian model. everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.